Good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, reading from the ESV. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which our most presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffer, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's great to see all of you. Thank you, brother. And uh, happy two-year anniversary to you. It's exciting. Before I uh, jump into the message today, I just want to give a quick shout out to those who serve on our prayer team. We have a group of dedicated prayer warriors who pray Sunday nights. They pray before service in our pre-service prayer. Uh, they pray here at the altar, and a lot of what they do is hidden. It's unseen, uh, but it's so important because the kingdom of God advances through the prayers of saints. So I want to thank Ife, Jessica, Amy, Angela, Audrey, Christina, Debbie, my dad and mom, Fonda, Pastor Mark, and EJ. Can we give it up for some of those prayer warriors? Hey, now that it's getting warmer, uh, where do you enjoy going to in D.C. on a warm spring day like this weekend? For me and my family, one of our favorite traditions, uh, especially when it gets warmer, is to go two blocks away to uh, a place called Eastern Market, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You've probably been there, many of you. And Eastern Market, is, it's such a unique place because, first of all, there's incredible diversity, right? You have uh, people doing pottery, you have uh, artists, you have painters, sculptors, you have amazing fresh produce, uh, you have the, the empanadas there. Has anybody had the blueberry buckwheat pancakes? at market lunch. I mean, there's just some great food. And yet there's also this unity in the sense that in order for this market or each of these vendors, the 100 vendors from five different continents, for them to survive and thrive, the whole market has to thrive. There's this diversity and yet there's this unity. In fact, uh, as a church, we, we had a, a tent there a couple uh, Saturdays and especially early on, and I got to know some of the inner workings of the market from, from doing that. And it was always interesting to me how uh, people would jockey for uh, more visible or more prominent space at the market amongst vendors. But at the same time, they also recognized that if the weather was bad, it was going to hurt everyone's business. If the weather was good, everyone was going to be good. If the market shut down, everybody would suffer. So in one sense, there was diversity, there was uniqueness. But in another sense, there was an interdependentness. 
there was a need for unity. And I wonder, uh, I think that is so different. What's, what's kind of phenomenal about that is it's so different than much of what we experience in culture today. We're really good about the creative, the individual part, right? In fact, sociologist uh, Robert Bella describes the day that we live in as uh, an exp- individual expression. That's really the, the calling card. Or uh, there's, a, there's a philosopher, Canadian philosopher, Charles Taylor, who calls our age the age of authenticity, where what is paramount is you being able to express who you are in the fullest sense. That if you can you know, be you, be true to yourself, then that is kind of the ideal, even more so than maybe what truth is. Truth has now become relative, right? It's my truth, which sounds amazing. Until you go through something hard, and you realize that in this age of authenticity, this age of individualism, that when you go through something hard, when life hits you in the face, there's nobody next to you, no one to weather the storm, no one to stand with you, that we actually need each other. We need each other. The Apostle Paul, um, he's giving an analogy for the church. And he describes the church as the body of Christ. It's one of his favorite metaphors. And the reason being is is because he had this revelation. The way he came into the kingdom of God was really through a revelation of the church, if you think about it. If you're unfamiliar with the story, Saul was, first he was Paul, formerly he was Saul. He was persecuting Christians. He was overseeing uh, imprisonment of Christians, he actually oversaw the death of the first martyr, Stephen. And he's on the road to Damascus, ready to throw more Christians in, into prison, because he was thinking that Christians were uh, almost like a, a, a heretical sect of Judaism. And so he thinks he's doing the will of God. And Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus, appears to him in a vision. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? Me. Me. Meaning every time you imprison someone, every time you persecuted a Christian, when you oversaw the death of Stephen, who you were hurting was more than just my followers. You were hurting me. Paul, in a very real sense, got a revelation that we are the body of Christ, that Christians are the body of Christ. And today, I want to just give you one observation that's clear. It's throughout this whole passage. It's easy to pick up on. I want to give you two dangers or pitfalls that we're in danger of. And lastly, draw a couple of conclusions from our passage today. So so here's the first thing, and it is all over the passage. I mean, you, you, you see it right from beginning to end. You have been joined to the body of Christ. Now, I know that's probably familiar for most of you. You know that. But I don't know that the reality of that has fully sunk in for us. That Jesus Christ, the resurrected king, the king of all kings, that you're a part of his body if you put your faith in Jesus. Now, most of us don't view church that way. We don't think about church as something we've been joined to. We think church more of like, like how we view restaurants. Now, my wife and I, um, we're more of like a Chick-fil-A type of couple, right? <laughs> like if we're really going to splurge, you know, we might go to Matchbox down the street or Ambar. But, you know, once a year, maybe on our anniversary or maybe on Valentine's Day, like we'll really go all out. And so the last time that I had a, a really nice meal with my wife, you know, I made a comment. I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm grateful that you're, you're in it for the food, Right? I mean, the ambiance, okay, but the food is, is where it's really at. And she didn't say anything. <laughs> and, and my wife is, she's very subtle. She's not, you know, she's not very particular. She's, but I made a mental note. I think I might have got that one wrong. <laughs> I think she actually does care about ambiance. And so, you know, my family, we were walking through, uh, we were going to this, this place Uh, that kind of overlooks all of D.C. I think it's called like the Postal Tower or something like that. And so we go through the Waldorf Astoria in order to get that. 
And if you've ever been in the Waldorf Astoria, I mean, it is immaculate. And there's this restaurant there called Bazaar by Jose Andres. Now, those of you who are foodies, you're saying amen right now, right? You're, I just lost you. You're thinking about... But I noticed she took notice of, of the atmosphere, right? And so, you know, again, I'm a little bit slow, but 10 years in, I'm starting to learn, Pastor Mark. I'm starting to learn. So I made a mental note. I booked us a reservation at Bazaar on Valentine's Day. <laughs> on Valentine's Day. And we sat down and we had this amazing meal. But while we were at this meal, we're critiquing various dishes, right? Oh, wow, you know that? I mean, I had this starfish with ceviche on top with a lemon puree. Like, just the accentuation of the flavors, right? I mean, it was just, it was incredible. But we were, but, but when you go to a restaurant, you're evaluating, you're critiquing. Oh, I'm going to have a little bit of more of that. I don't want that, right? If you don't like the restaurant, you go somewhere else. And I think when it comes to church, it's all, that's oftentimes how we view church. Okay, well, I'm going to do a little bit of that, but eh, I don't like that. Oh, Pastor Stephen's preaching this Sunday. Oh, darn it. I'm going to wait till next Sunday. <laughs> the worship team, man, I love, oh, they're singing that song today. Eh, I don't know. We're kind of critiquing. We're kind of evaluating. But what Paul wants to make very clear is the church is not something that you pick. The church is something that you're joined to. That when you give your life to Jesus, you're joined to Jesus in his church. You become a part of his body. Now, you have discernment to decide, you know, what church you want to go to and pray through that and what, you know, where God is. But the key is, where is God calling you? Where is God joining you to? Not what's your preference, because if you're going based on your preference, your preferences change. As great as ceviche on star fruit is, I'm not in the mood for that right now. Our preferences change, but the people who God has joined us to, that doesn't change. God has joined us to the body of Christ, which means you have a role to play. Now, being joined to Jesus, I mean, that's great. I mean, who wouldn't want to be joined to Jesus? Jesus is the embodiment of compassion. He's full of grace and truth. He sacrificed his life for you. Like, if... If you have a problem with Jesus, can I just suggest it's probably you and not him? <laughs> but being joined to the church is a little bit less comfortable. It's a little bit harder. Because what always happens is God, it's like he strategically puts us with people, some of whom we don't like, some of whom are different than us. And we end up sitting in a small group and in, church, in a church of 100 people, almost all of whom we love, we end up sitting next to the person that we kind of gets on our nerves a little bit. It's almost as if God has assigned seats. Now, don't look around. Don't make any eye contact, okay? But the point is, it's Jesus' body. It's not your body. And Jesus died for his body. You didn't die for the body. And so if Jesus invited you to be a part of his body in spite of you, then who are we to exclude others because of things that we don't like about them? You've been joined to the body of Christ, and you're looking at the body, his body. Now, Paul gives, um, he gives two warnings, or two dangers, I would say, two kind of opposite pitfalls that we can fall into. And the first I would call the inferiority, inferiority, there we go, inferiority complex. It picks up in verse 14. I want you to, to see this with me, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. He says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. So there are certain parts of the body of Christ, certain members or, or body parts in this analogy that seem to be more prominent or significant, right? Like if I forgot to come to church today, that we might have a problem. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, maybe someone like Pastor Mark could come up here and preach, but you would feel the difference because he didn't have time to prepare. If Shanique today forgot that this was her Sunday to lead worship, we might have an issue. 
Like, I'm confident that our worship team would, would rally together and we would put something that was pleasing to Jesus. It might only be pleasing to him, but <laughs> we would... No, I'm just kidding. We, we would do great, I'm sure. But we would feel, we would feel her absence, right? And so we tend to think that there are certain people in the church, those with more visible roles, that they're important and we're not as important. And so it, it explains why, on average, American Christians come to church maybe once a month. Because if you don't come to church, then is anybody really going to notice? And yet, if you think about some of the more or, or some of the less visible parts of the body, some of the more invisible parts, are they not crucial to the body's growth and development and health? I mean, think about right now the people who are not in this room who are downstairs working with our kids. Now, I have the privilege of preaching to you all maybe half a year, half the uh, Sundays of the year, and I love you all, and I am so grateful for an opportunity to preach, but I recognize that the majority of you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You're pretty set in your ways. I mean, I believe the Spirit of God can convict you and change you, but it's harder to change when you're old. But those seven, eight, nine-year-olds, those four-year-olds, man, if you speak a word of encouragement, that'll change your life forever. You believe in a kid, you deposit the word of God. Is there any more strategic group of people to invest in than our kids? They're invisible, seemingly, but they're important. And even if they don't think they're important, it doesn't change the fact that they're a significant part of the body of Christ. Think about our security team. We purposely don't tell you who our security team is because that would defeat the purpose. They're supposed to be incognito. And as little as you think about our security team, I can, I can assure you that if somebody came into this church that looked a little bit dangerous, you would stop caring what I was saying and you would start thinking about your safety. How about the AV team? The only time people notice the AV team is when there's a mistake. <laughs> but if they were not here, we would be having service in the dark today. That would be an interesting vibe. <laughs> we wouldn't have online service. We wouldn't have these lyrics helping you. The AV team, though less visible, are important. Paul's point is that every member of the body of Christ, every part of the body has a role and is important. And so maybe you're here and you say, well, actually, Pastor Stephen, I, I don't have a role. And so if I am not here, well, literally, the church will go on because I'm not here very often. Let me encourage you. Let me encourage you that if I take this wedding ring off, I'm still married. <laughs> let, me, let me not lose this. That's the one mistake I would not be able to recover from if I lost that. <laughs> if I went to a club tonight, I'd still be married. I'd be living as a single person, but still married. Experientially, though, I wouldn't be representing and being the husband that I was called to be, right? Well, if you're, um, uh, you're, when you give your life to Jesus, you become a member or a part of the body of Christ. But if you're, not, if you're not serving, if you're not a part in community, then you are a member. You're still a member. You're still a member in reality, but experientially, you're separated. You're separated. Now, you're going to get the revelation right here. You ready? How do people view Jesus in, the, in our culture today? A lot of folks will say about Jesus, I love Jesus. I appreciate Jesus. It's the church that I have an issue with. But, but Jesus, Jesus died for the church. Jesus calls the church his bride. Jesus calls the church his body. So if someone says they love Jesus but not the church, do they really love Jesus? Because the Jesus I know loves his bride. But maybe they have a view of Jesus, an incorrect view of Jesus, because of what they've experienced with the church. They've seen Jesus walking around without a hand. They've seen Jesus, the embodiment of Jesus in the church, walking around with a limp because the foot is not connected. The hand is not connected. You can, be a, you can be a part of the body of Christ, and yet if you're not experiencing that, if you're not living in community with other believers, if you're not serving and using your gifts to serve God and to build up the body of Christ, you are 
representing a Jesus that's missing body parts. Yeah. And no wonder the church, the culture goes, they have an improper view of who Jesus is. I want, listen, if it was just about me, if it was just about Grace Covenant Church, I would say, hey, do your thing. But we're talking about our risen Lord and King, yeah. how we are going to embody him to each other and to the community. I beg you, find a way, no matter how insignificant you may feel, no matter how insignificant you might feel your spiritual gifts are, find a way to serve and to be a part of community because there's someone out there who will see a greater expression of who Jesus is through your life and through your service. Now, the second pitfall is what people like me are more prone to, which is we have a superiority complex. That's, the ten, that's, the, that's what we have to guard against. Yeah. Thinking, okay, we know who the real important people are in church. Now, you never say that out loud, right? But you have those thoughts. When I, was, when I came on staff at Grace Covenant Church, I was 22 years old, and I was just thrilled that somebody was going to pay me to be in ministry. Like, I, I, I felt like I had a life hack. Like, they're going to pay me to do this? Like, lead devotionals and lead Bible studies and preach the gospel and train up leaders and be in high schools and middle schools? I was, I was working as an assistant youth pastor. I mean, what, a, what an opportunity. I was thrilled. Now, there were some things I wasn't excited about, as excited about, sending emails and meetings and various things like that. But I endured those things because I got to do the stuff. And we had this person on our team, uh, a staff member, who um, was very administratively gifted, very, um, she played more of a supportive role on the youth team, uh, but she, she had an ability to connect with, with young ladies in particular. And as a 22-year-old, 20, a little bit full of myself, I had a little bit of Jesus and a lot of myself in me, okay? I thought to myself, okay, she's important, she's a part of the team, but really, like, I mean, come on, right? Like, she can't be as important as me, right? And then she went on vacation. <laughs> and I'll never forget, it was a Wednesday afternoon. It was about 5 p.m. Our youth ministry was at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday night. It was 5 p.m. And my role was to pick up some of the things that she normally did for that week that she was out. And so I, my only task was I was to kind of rearrange some margins of the small group handout and print them out. And I thought, that, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, right? I mean, I was a finance major. I went to Virginia Tech. I'm a pretty smart guy. I can figure out, you know, some, some pages on and, and layouts and printing, right? And I sat there for three hours, <laughs> banging my head against this printer, recognizing that I am not gifted administratively. What's the opposite of a gift? I had an anti-gift of administration. <laughs> And that began a week of me failing miserably at everything that she made look so easy throughout the week. And I recognized that she played just as important of a role that I did, probably even a more important role. Paul says in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Nobody has ever come up to me and said, Stephen, you have a great liver. <laughs> Gosh, your heart beats so regularly. The parts of our body that are invisible, some of our organs, they may be invisible, but they're crucial to our life, to our vitality. Some of the members of Christ's body that appear to be invisible are crucial to our life in Jesus. So if you're in a more visible role in this church, take a moment to honor, to thank those who serve behind the scenes. Thank our prayer team who who come 30 minutes early to service, 45 minutes early, and just pray. Nobody knows their names, maybe. Or maybe you don't. I do. Because I desperately need their prayers. Thank the ushers for picking up trash and, and giving you, uh, uh, showing you your seat and ensuring that our finances are handled correctly and get into the proper place when we take up an offering. Thank the people who give their life 
who give up their time, who give up their resources in order to make the body of Christ go. Then two reasons. Verse 25. So to, to summarize, Paul says, hey, you're the body of Christ. So if you think you're not important, you are important. No matter what your role is, God has chosen the various members. Play your role. Use your gifts. Build up the body. Then he says, hey, if you think you're really important, you're not that important. Honor, thank, be appreciative of those who might be less visible. And here's why, verse 25, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. No division in care. Society right now is so divided. We're divided politically. We're divided socioeconomically. The church in Corinth was divided. Here they were in this city that was very similar to ours. They were a diverse people. They were Jew and Gentile. They were the haves and the have-nots. They were very diverse. And that diversity led to division because they had a, they didn't, they had a, a pride problem. And so Paul writes to communicate how the gospel informs how we do life together. Here was this church that they were divided on who they... Some said, I follow Pastor Stephen. Others said, I follow Pastor Mark. They had their favorite leader. They were divided over those who were socioeconomically well off and those who weren't. They were divided over spiritual gifts. Everyone, you know, everyone, because they came out of this pagan background, like, well, I know there's normally one person who preaches, but I got a message to share. And so you had 10 people sharing a message. You had a bunch of people blaring out in tongues. You had people grabbing them. They didn't have a microphone back then, but I think they were grabbing the the metaphorical microphone to prophesy. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. This is Christ's body. Diversity, yes, but we also need unity. And when a church chooses to put Jesus above their political affiliation, when a church decides to put Jesus above their preference when it comes to music and dress, when a church decides to put Jesus above everything else, the world sees a Jesus that's united. He sees the bride of Christ, and they can't figure out how do all these black, white, Latino, Asian people, how do all these people who are rich and poor, how do all these people who are young and old, how do these men and women worship the same God, come to church and do life together? There must be something different about them. There must be something that explains the source of their unity. Yes, it's Jesus. And that's what our diversity and unity is meant to be, so that Christ isn't divided. And secondly, he says, care. Now, if you could toss me, sweetheart, um, how many of you guys remember this game right here? Remember this? <laughs> Operation. The reason why kids love this game and parents absolutely hate it is because of this noise. <laughs> right? And what happens is, this is really a picture of what the body of Christ is supposed to be because when one member suffers, we all hear it. When one member mourns, we all mourn. When one one member is honored, we all rejoice. But here's the problem, and I'll see if I can get one of these parts out. The problem is when we get disconnected to the body of Christ, this is a femur, if you didn't know. We get separated. We're still following Jesus, but, you know, church, we're too busy for church, or maybe, you know, we're hurt by church because there's churches full of broken people and sinful people, and so we get hurt, we get offended, and we distance ourselves. And what happens is we start hurting, but because we're not connected to the body, nobody hears. And we're isolated, and we're alone, and nobody's there to help and to mourn with us when, we need, when we're mourning or to rejoice with us when we're honored. I beg you, don't Disconnect yourself from what Jesus died to bring you into. He brought you into the body of Christ. So use your gifts. Use your time, your energy, your resources. Get in community with other folks so that Jesus would be embodied to this community and to this church the way he deserves. Amen? Amen. Pastor Stephen, what do you want me to do? Run through that wall. No, I'm just kidding. No, (laughs) what I want you to do very simple takeaway. What I want you to do is if you haven't been to our Life at Grace class, start right there. 
If you've been going to a church for a couple months, maybe you're checking things out, but when God calls you to be a part of the church, go to that class. Learn about who we are. Me and Lou will sit down with you. We'll do a spiritual gifts assessment with you. We'll plug you in to a ministry, and you can start using your gifts to serve Jesus. Amen? Maybe you are already serving. Thank you for what you do week in and week out. We wouldn't be the church that God had called us to be if it weren't for you. If you're already serving, can I just encourage you to take a moment sometime today and just to thank somebody else who's a blessing to you in the area of service. Just go up to the AV team and high five them. Go down to the kids ministry and just thank them for what they do. Go to, go to the ushers and say, hey, I'm going to give you a, a, a bottle of water instead of you giving me a bottle of water today. Find a way, find a creative way to serve and to thank somebody who re regularly serves us. Amen. And finally, if you're here today and maybe you're not a part of the body of Christ, you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, can I encourage you that this is a great day to surrender your life to Jesus and to be put into his family, to be a member of the body of Christ, to walk in the purposes for which God has called you to walk. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that if that's you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you've sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. You purchased us. You redeemed us so that we could be a part of your family, that we could be a part of the body of Christ. What a privilege If there's anybody here who wants to surrender their life to Jesus for the first time or maybe come back to Jesus, you, maybe you've strayed away from him and today's the day that you want to come back to him, would you just raise your hand real high this morning? I'd like to pray for you. Amen. If you're watching online and, and that's you, just pray after me. Just say, Father, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. Today I choose to turn from my sin and to believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died and that you rose again. Come into my life. Change my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, we have a class that we call Discover Discipleship, and it just walks you through the basics of what it means to follow Jesus. And if you'll just take out your phone and text GCCCH to 82155 and click on the New Life link, We'll get connect, you connected to that class and get you started on your journey of following Jesus. Church.